owners. <laughs> Shocking. Yeah, they never really liked us much anyways, did they? So, yeah, this article goes on to talk about, this was from their July 21. It's a draft platform that contains the following passage. Okay, Democrats will enact universal background checks and online sales of guns and ammunition, close dangerous loopholes that currently allowed stalkers and some individuals convicted of assault or battery to buy and possess firearms, and adequately fund the federal background check system. We will close the Charleston loophole, and prevent individuals who have been convicted of hate crimes from possessing firearms. Democrats will ban the manufacture and sale of assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. We will incentivize sales to enact licensing requirements for owning firearms and red flag laws that allow courts to temporarily remove guns from the possession of those who are in a danger to themselves or others. We will pass legislation requiring that guns be safely stored in homes, and Democrats believe that gun companies should be held responsible for their products just like any other business and will prioritize repealing the law that shields gun manufacturers from civil liability. If I were a manufacturer of anything, that last line should scare the daylights out of you if you're a manufacturer. So anytime somebody would misuse a product that you built, you might possibly be held liable for any use that they. So same car manufacturers. If you're a car manufacturer and somebody does one of these brazen attacks where they drive through a riot or they drive through uh, a seaside resort like we've been seeing over the years or they drive into the middle of a campus like we saw Ohio State and somebody jumps out and starts stabbing people, are you as a car manufacturer now responsible because somebody used that car that way? That's crazy. Um You know, kitchen knives. (laughs) How many times are kitchen knives used in homicides and assaults every year? Hammers. You know, there are probably more people killed with hammers than any type of firearm in the past. Um, So is now, you know, Stanley now in trouble, (laughs) the company, because they manufactured a hammer. Are they going to be held responsible for that? So uh, pretty scary stuff. Um, But just in general, the whole that whole last paragraph about what they uh, propose to do, if you're a firearms owner, man, who know where, where does that put you? Are you suddenly going to become a felon because the Democrats got in office and oh boy, now I'm hoping this election year it's going to be a silent majority type thing and even though um, Uncle Joe is leading in the in the polls right now, hopefully it's a Hillary thing and he takes a SWAT and you know, come election night we end up not having to worry about it. But if he gets in office, <clears throat> we are in uh, some pretty serious trouble if they suddenly start coming for guns. So, and, it, and I think you guys know from listening to this show, I am not, you know, the government's going to get me type of guy. But, man, the more I look at stuff going on, it's, it's pretty scary if you're a gun owner. So, and again, if you're a manufacturer of any type of product that people misuse, like I said, uh, we can have a serious problem. You know, they talk about universal background checks. You know, we've got some pretty stringent background checks now. And if you look at most of these mass shooters and people who commit crimes, a background check probably wouldn't have stopped them anyways. A lot of these guys own guns uh, legally and do stuff. But most of the people who uh, commit some of these crimes are not necessarily people who are going to go through a background check anyways. They're going to get their guns illegally, most likely. They're going to bypass, you know, they're going to steal guns. They're going to buy guns from people who sold them to them, you know, or knew what they were up to and they were part of their little plan. So (laughs) background checks aren't all they're cracked up to be. And if they wanted to get into our personal business of me selling a gun between me and a friend, um, you know, that's not what this country is based on. <laughs> if I want to do private commerce with somebody, then I'm going to do private commerce and we're going to do what we need to do. And government needs to keep their hands out of it. Just like you want government out of your bedroom. You want government out of your personal lives. Um, I want government out of my personal life too. And, um, I want them out of my gun sales and anything else I'm doing with my firearms. They don't need to know none of your business. <laughs> Just saying, um, you know, red flag laws. They talk about that in here. Uh, You know, I go back and forth on this one. Red flag laws can be a good thing, depending on how they are done. The problem becomes, you know, they talk about people who aren't competent to own a firearm. So who starts to make that decision? You know, uh, I can see where a family member might be worried about another family member uh, owning a gun and they're getting senile. 
Um, but on the flip side of that, do you want to take that protection away from that person? You know, depending on the circumstance, or they do they live someplace where they need that protection, and now you're going to strip them of that. It, it's a balance. I understand. Um, the flip side of that, I worry about, is it being misused? You know, the jilted ex lover who knows you own a firearm, and now they're calling. Um, you know, I broke up with my girlfriend. I'm mad at her. I know she owns a gun and now I'm calling the police and trying to red flag her. That's terrifying. Um, and how are they going to serve the red flag notification? Is this going to be a no knock warrant? <laughs> Is this going to be a show up at the house and say, Hey, we heard you have a firearm. Is it going to be friendly? Uh, I don't know. How's this? You know, we've seen some no knock stuff go pretty sideways over the last couple of years. And, you know, I'm not against no knocks, not a fan, but I'm not dead set against them because I understand the the thought process is catching people off guard and, you know, keeping them from running and stuff. And if they're serious felons, they've killed people, then, yeah, let's no knock them and, and take them down. But, um, you know, we saw Brianna Taylor and there's some questions on that, whether the no knock was a, a good thing or a bad thing. Um, again, I don't ever have to do that job and I don't ever want a Monday morning quarterback too much stuff like that. Uh, so it's horrible. So, um you know, they're talking about three-day safety valve provision. That didn't really work last time. You know, we had the Brady stuff, and it was, what was that, a five-day waiting period or 10-day waiting period? Uh, listen, if you're mad enough that you're going to kill somebody, <laughs> a five- or 10-day waiting period isn't probably going to cool you off that much. It might stop the instance, hey, I'm angry right this second, I'm going to shoot you, but guess what? Most people who are that pissed off, it's not the gun that's going to cause a problem. If, if I'm that pissed off, I'll walk in the kitchen and grab a butcher knife. Um, if I'm that pissed off, I'm going to grab the hammer. Uh, if I'm that pissed off, I'm going to smash you in the face with a frying pan. So those type of things are more immediately available. And if you look at the stats, you know, more people are killed by hammers, like I said before, than probably firearms every year. So, you know, the immediacy and the anger, these type of cooling off periods aren't going to save anyone. They might save them directly from having a gun used against them. But is it going to save that person that you were trying to save because of a, um, a, a cooling off period? Probably not. Um, you know, that, that is what it is. And, of course, they're going to, uh, you know, they want to ban commonly owned automatic firearms in their magazines. Um, so, you know, when they start getting into, you know, semi-autos, there's no good reason to have them. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know that the Constitution was written and said, and you need good reason to have it. <laughs> the reason we have it is that's why they wrote it into the Constitution. Thank you. Um, we don't necessarily have to explain a good reason. Uh, that's why they wrote it into the Constitution so that we could have them. And we know that they were written into the Constitution for things like if the First Amendment, you know, is taken away, then the second is there to protect it and every other um, amendment from there on out. So, yeah, it's it's crazy times. Um, you know, you can catch your whole platform. I'll put this link up from NRA ILA on the website. And in the podcast notes, and you can read the whole platform. Um, yeah, all kinds of crazy stuff on that platform. So, anyways, uh, let's see what other fun do we have going on this week. Oh, the <laughs> so I'm teaching a class over the weekend, and uh, we are in the middle of what I will call the great concealed carry license conundrum. <laughs> so, if you are taking a class for concealed carry, if you are about to take a class for concealed carry, if you just took a class to get your concealed handgun license. Good luck actually getting your license. Um, I would say that if you're thinking about taking a class, I would go ahead and try to book your appointment now, even before you take the class. But John, why am I doing that? Um, you know, depending on where you, where you live, it could be a while before you get your license or even be able to renew. Um, we were looking, so I taught my last class over in Jaga County. We were looking at Jaga County and Lake County's website because those are probably the two most popular um, sheriff's offices to apply to coming out of Jaga. If you're Lake or Ashibula, those both of those sheriff's offices do a really good job and turn stuff around quickly. And you know everyone's gone to an appointment at this point, uh, so you used to be able to walk into Jaga and do your license. Now they're strictly by appointment. Um, so Lake County actually took their license stuff offline again because they will only schedule for 90 days out so if you're talking what is it, august now august september october minimum you're into november in lake county and that's if you know they get it back up in, in november and, and start taking more appointments uh jaga county was booked out till january that's crazy um 
So yeah, again, if you're getting ready to get your license, seriously think about booking out, get the class in now and try to book the appointment as soon as you can. So I, I decided to look around the state and just kind of randomly pick some uh, sheriff's office from around the state. Uh, and of course I had to go pick on Cuyahoga County. <laughs> I couldn't even log into their website. Uh, theirs was completely down last night. Um, it may be back up today. I haven't checked. So they're so probably far behind that they just took everything down and said, don't even try it. Ashtabula, similar. It's up, but it says no appointments are available. So if you're in Lake Jaga, some of the other counties over that way, you're not getting in. Summit County, and I'm going to get a little bit further south, but kind of still in this region, and I'm kind of down in Summit County today. Uh, They are booked until January. Franklin County, another one of our liberal bastions of uh, liberalism here in Ohio, they actually had openings in September. I was baffled by this. Um, Not sure why. You would think Franklin being a little bit bigger county and, and being where they are that they would um, be booked up, but they actually have openings in September. So any of you down around that way, go now, (laughs) run. They may already be gone. Uh, Hamilton County down around Cincinnati pulled theirs up. Uh, They have two openings available in November. (laughs) So I'm guessing those are probably gone now, almost a little less than 24 hours later. I I bet those are well off the books and and gone out the door. Uh, Lucas County, which is up around, I believe, Toledo when I looked, uh, if I remember correctly. They are also uh, booked out into November. So, hmm, that's amazing. So it looks like most of the state is in the same quandary. It's not just kind of us here in Northeast Ohio and, and a little bit south of where we are in Northeast Ohio. Uh, it looks like most of the state is is running into the same problem. The good news is, for all of you who are wanting their license, if you take the class, you have three years from the time you take the class to actually go get your license. So you can take it now and book... <laughs> Now, if they'll let you sometime next year, but it looks like most of the sheriff's offices, like I said, are pulling them down. You know, they're not going out past about 90 days to schedule. So, and who knows, this whole thing may change. Um, it may completely change in November if the Democrats win and the virus goes away somehow magically, right? I'm kidding. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Okay. Maybe I am a little bit. Um, so here's a wacky story that, that really, uh, this popped up uh, probably a couple of weeks ago and I just haven't gotten a chance to get to it. So I didn't realize that if you train too much, you were going to be judged differently because you trained too much. You were going to be looked at um, differently because you are too good at what you do, so, at least in the shooting world. Uh, so this was an LAPD uh, use of force um, scenario. An officer, uh, I believe Tony McBride, uh, ended up shooting a person carrying a knife. The argument was that Officer McBride had trained so well that she just decided that her instinct, with all this training that she's had as a competitive shooter, was going to overcome all of her training to de-escalate and stuff, and she was going to go hog wild and shoot this guy because she enjoys shooting things quickly. What in the heck? <laughs> So, yeah, this is, um, uh, I am just baffled by this article. Uh, You know, an officer from the article, an officer must reasonably believe that he or she needed to use deadly force to defend against an imminent threat or death or serious bodily injury to an officer or to another person. So even as a civilian in Ohio, you're going to be held to the same standard, right? You you have to honestly believe that you are in fear for your life or fear of serious bodily harm. Um, So this officer is kind of going to the same standard. So what happens is this gentleman decides to, I don't know if he just plowed into a bunch of cars. It was like five cars, creates an accident. Um, and when the officer arrives on the scene, not sure where this guy is. She's getting witnesses reports. There's a lot of chaos. Um, she's trying to get people out of the scene. She's trying to get them out of their cars and get them away from, you know, what she thinks she may have to respond to as a deadly incident. So she has her gun out. Um, this guy pops out from behind an SUV. And he's got a knife in his hand. So she picks that up. Now, mind you, she is close enough to see that this guy has a knife in his hand. So if you have my kind of eyesight, he had to be pretty close. And I'm trying to gauge by the cars and stuff of how close he really was to her. Um, I would say he was probably three car lengths away when she first starts yelling commands to him. So here's a guy who, who knows why he crashed his car. And he is disobeying a direct order and hey put the knife down put the knife down 
Um, and he continues to come towards her. And now, mind you, there are other people still close by, probably 10 to 15 feet away from this guy. The officer shoots him. So people are like, oh, my God, she should have de-escalated. She should have blah. She should have done this. She done a Listen, you weren't there. You weren't part of the chaos. Listen to the 911 call on this if you get a chance. Again, I'll post a link here. Um, you know, I think she had reason to believe that she could be harmed or killed or somebody nearby could have been. And now she's got a, she has a duty to protect those people. Us as civilians, we wouldn't have that duty. We could try to, you know, by Ohio law, we're supposed to try to get out of that type of situation. She's got a different standard. She's there to protect people. Um, so had a guy turned and run into the crowd or attack somebody else, what would the story have been then? Would she have been held responsible for not protecting those people? You know, what kind of standard is that then? She's, you know, she didn't do her job. What was wrong with her? My family member died because she didn't step up. So as you go on to read the story, they start talking about the attorney who took on the case uh, against the officer. And, you know, uh, Daniel Hernandez was the guy who, who did this. So Daniel Hernandez's parents and 14-year-old daughter argue their attorney, <laughs> through their attorney, that McBride could have done more to de-escalate the situation. She might, for example, have stepped behind a bystander's car to buy time. They say they they contend that she responded like the competitive competitive shooter seen on video racing to get off shots. Listen, if you watch the video, she was calm, cool, collected, um, was not racing. She was very methodical with how she placed her shots. And listen, you guys, if you read studies about shootings with police officers, their hit rates are pretty low. And from what I can tell from that video, she put all of her rounds where they needed to be on this guy. Had there been, and there were other people around, had she overshot, you know, somebody would have been in some serious trouble. A, she runs into trouble because she shoots somebody who doesn't need shot. B, they run into trouble because the city gets sued, even though they are anyways, because she missed her shot. So she was awesome. <laughs> you know, now we've got a 14-year-old and some family members who you know, don't squat, don't know squat about Dudley force who are saying that the officer should have responded in a certain way. Um, yeah, that's crazy. So from the attorney, she loved to shoot all things as fast as she can. said Casillas, the lawyer for Hernandez's family. That certainly is in stark contrast to the measured, cautious police officer exhibiting a reverence for life. This isn't a movie. Um, Exactly. It's not a movie. The bad guy's not going to fall down or necessarily run away or put his hands in the air and go down on the ground. And this officer acted how she felt. And I feel horrible. She's going to get dragged through the mud, I'm sure, um, and go through all kinds of hearings and stuff and probably get suspended. And uh, Yeah, it, it, to me, the, the fact that this woman is being um, chastised because she was too good at her job is crazy. You know, I, I think this is getting into some of the standards we're seeing now. Oh, you don't have to have to be good at what you do. You can just, you know, Oh, we feel bad. You shouldn't have to try that hard. Here's a trophy. So that's kind of what we're running into. I think with this, I don't mean to be glib about it and laugh, but you know, this is kind of what I'm seeing from society at times is, Hey, you don't have to be that good. Um, this lady was really good. Now she's being, um, chastised for it and, and being hunted and, <laughs> and burned at the stake. So, that's crazy. Um, you know, yeah, anyways. <laughs> so here's my question. If this attorney wins this case and defends the uh, police officer, is that attorney now going to be held to a different standard because they were too good at what they did and they got the police officer off? I mean, this is a dangerous slope we're on now. If you were too good and you win all the time because you're good at what you do, are you going to be held to a different standard and, and knocked down? That's nuts. Um, I don't get it. Anyways, enough ranting. Um, <laughs> all right, next article. I'll, I'll move on now. So I get asked in class, you know, John wants the best gun for concealed carry. You know, what should I carry? Um, what's the best gun for me and for concealed carry? And I always answer with a resounding, it depends, and I can't answer that for you. <laughs> this is such a super personal journey you're going to have to go through on your own to get the answer. But we have magazines like Recoil Magazine, um, and they came up with some suggestions, some of the best concealed handguns for 2020. Um, they do make some really good points along the way that aren't even really gun-related, um, so we'll touch on those a little bit. You know, I make a lot of suggestions that are similar to this article. The best carry gun is one that fits into your lifestyle. 
If you try to carry something that's too big or intrusive, it's just not going to work, and you're not going to carry it. Let's be honest. If there's a you know, if you dress a certain way and you're wearing yoga pants and you're trying to carry a 454 Casul with a eight inch barrel, <laughs> you know, probably not going to work. Now they do make some really great yoga pants now that have some holsters and stuff built into them, but they're probably still going to stick out when you've got the really large gun. Um, they're built for specific things. So you need to think through some of that good stuff. You know, you're going to need to have a good belt and a holster. If you're going to, you know, carry on your waistline or on your body, you know, you're going to have to make some decisions you know, am I going to dress around the gun or am I going to carry a gun that fits into my wardrobe? And those are slightly two different things. You know, am I going to dress like around a full size gun and wear stuff that is going to fit that? Or am I going to go ahead and, you know, pick a smaller gun that's going to fit into the wardrobe I already wear? You know, my my skin tight acid wash jeans aren't cutting it anymore. So, you know, I got to buy clothes that are a little bit bigger. <laughs> so, and nobody wants to see me in skinny jeans. I know my wife probably just texted me. She's like, what is wrong with you? Anyways. Um, so the first suggestion from this article, they suggest one of the best concealed guns for 2020 is the Glock 19 MOS. So this is a Glock that has a Trigicon RMR on top. Um, if you're not familiar with how red dots work and Trigicons work, they produce a little red dot on a little screen on the top of the gun. You know, we call it the little television screen of death. <laughs> I've heard people argue um, that you need to learn to shoot with iron sights first. You know, I'm not so sure I agree with that anymore. I've had some instances where I've taken beginners, and before I even had them learn iron sights, I gave them my gun with a dot on it, and it's like a, the easy button. You know, sometimes you put that red dot where you want it to be, and squeeze off around. Now there will tell, tell there will be people who tell you that having equipment, if you're a crappy shooter, isn't going to change you being a crappy shooter. So giving somebody a red dot who hasn't built up some bad habits is not a bad way to get them to learn to shoot. Um, you know the issue does become if the red dot goes out. Listen, I carried a Trigicon RMR for quite a while, and the only time that thing probably went out was when I changed the battery. So, you know, most of these red dots now have come far enough where they're not going out. Um, now, if you would get mud and stuff on it, you drop it in the mud and the and the lens gets, you know, uh, covered, of course the red dot's not going to be there. But, you know, same thing. If you dropped your gun in the mud and you covered your regular sights, is that going to be a thing? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Again, learn to shoot iron sights, but red dots really go a long way, and I can see why they... Um, suggest this gun i am a fan of the glock 19 and so the one i carry around most of the time uh, about 99.9 percent i had a glock with an rmr i loved it uh just too old now <laughs> and my my eyes don't adjust to the uh, red dot the way they used to and it looks like a big beautiful red flower instead of a nice clean dot for me now so that kind of defeats the purpose of carrying a red dot doesn't it uh the sig 320 um you know, this thing is winning military contracts, right? So there's going to be parts forever. So this is a, a really good concept and a, and a really good suggestion just because, listen, just like Berettas, you're going to find parts for these for forever just because who knows how many they're producing. Um, they also suggested the FN 509 midsize. So this thing is very similar to the Glock and the SIG 320. All three of these guns are very similar in size and shape. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with any of them. You know, FN seems to be one of those guns that doesn't get as much attention from civilians. And I don't know why. They've been around forever. I just don't know if FN just decided that they don't need to market to us and uh, us lowly civilians, and they've got military contracts come out their backside. So that's that's uh, maybe. Um, the article goes on to talk about some pistols that they lump into a micro-compact uh, category. Uh, the top of this list starts with the SIG 365. So this gun came out of the gate, and people jumped on this thing. It was rocking the gun world. Um, You know, the Glock 19, the SIG 320, and this gun, if you look at different sales um, articles, these three guns kind of top that list constantly, and there's good reason. This thing is small, um, but for a small gun, I am just so impressed with how little recoil is felt in this gun. I've seen small guns that just beat the snot out of you that are smaller in a semi-auto and smaller revolvers. I am definitely <laughs> on the side of, Oh, you better practice and know what you're getting into with those things, especially in a polymer frame. Um, they'll beat the crap out of you. Uh, this gun I think would be my next purchase. If I purchase another handgun, um, 
this would probably be where I would go. This or the Glock 43, which is the next one on their list. You know, we all know I'm a Glock fanboy. So, uh, again, this gun is smaller. Um, not the capacity is a, th- is a SIG 365, so you're getting probably fewer rounds in it. Uh, I would almost suggest going to a Glock 43 or 48 when you're looking at these. Or uh, Sorry, the Glock 43, yes. The, and I'm blanking on the company. There's a company that makes a higher capacity magazine that goes in these now. So they're right up there with SIG, if not a little bit um, higher. So good option. Small guns with large capacity, that's a good thing if you want something you're going to tote around every day and uh, not be completely uncomfortable with it. So these are these are some good options. They talk about the Walther PPS. And this does not look like the James Bond Walther that your grandpa <laughs> always talked about. Um, these things aren't, they look nothing like the old PPSs. Uh, they are single stack, um, kind of glocky looking like everything is now. But these things are limited to like six, seven, or eight rounds. Um, but again, that's better than a pointy stick. It is a small package that you can tote around pretty easily. Uh, we looked at them a while ago. I didn't actually shoot one, um, but it was almost a, a weird shape to it, so we didn't go with that. So the FN 509 Compact is also on this list. Um, I like it because it is a small gun that you can mount some RMR type optics on top of. That's pretty slick. You know, if you uh, can combine a small gun with a red dot, and if you have trouble seeing, uh, this is not a bad option. If you want, if you're able to pick up the red dot and you want to carry a smaller gun, this is a pretty good uh, package. So. Um, I would look at, when you start looking at concealed carry stuff or any type of gun, uh, I would base part of my choice on supportive aftermarket holsters, lights, magazines, things like that. Uh, You know, cost can vary widely on holsters and magazines. So if you're going to carry one of these guns um, or any gun, when you make a choice, you know, take people's advice, but give a serious look and thought to what is what is this gun gonna you know how am i gonna be able to find magazines are the magazines gonna be forty dollars each you know that's some things to take into consideration now if you're not poor like me that's not a big issue right <laughs> so i found a good article to follow up to this one so we talked about good carry guns so our friends at over at ammo land um threw out an article called summer carry options uh, they are pushing in this article, hiding the gun in plain sight. So this has been my motto in the summer for so long. This means the return of the fanny pack. Yes. I love my fanny pack. So I'm no longer out of style. I'm right back in style. Um, you know, when my kids were little, I've talked about this. I could throw my juice box. Well, not my juice box. Okay. I drank the kids juice box. I could throw a juice box in there. I could throw a diaper in there. You know, I could throw car keys in there and there was my gun right behind all of it. And it's a little holster with a breakaway tab. Um, and here I am in plain sight, you know, I look like the typical eighties holdover dad when, when the kids were little and no, I didn't have kids in the eighties. Um, I had kids much later, so I still look like I was in the eighties with my little fanny pack. Um, but again, the short, fat, dumb tourist looking guy with his, his khaki shorts and his, you know, cargo pants, um, had a gun and it was right there on his waist the whole time. And the family and I were safe and worked out well. So, um, from Galco, for those who are uh, daily aware is more of the casual, I love this word, athleisure side, don't forget about the best-selling Fast Tracks Pack. This is Galco's newest waist pack and is designed to blend with casual modern clothing styles while discreetly carrying a compact defensive handgun ready for instant action. It is a fanny pack. You can call it fancy names like Fast Tracks Pack or whatever, but it is a fanny pack. <laughs> it's available in gray and black and multi-cam and black leather. Uh, these things retail from anywhere from 79 to 109. You know, you're, you're getting Galco. You know, I would, I always cringe at prices that high for a fanny pack, but you know, anytime Galco puts something together, it's going to be great craftsmanship. Uh, so it's probably worth the price. Now they also came out with a, a new line of day planners. Now day planners were kind of popular back when I first started carrying guns. I haven't seen this to be as much of a thing anymore because who carries day planners? <laughs> I gave mine up way back, um, but they were pretty cool. You know, these things will hold a gun. They'll hold, you know, notepads. They will hold a place for extra ammo depending on the size. Um, so they've got a couple different versions. One's called the Defense Planner. One's called the Hidden Agenda, and one is called the Eye Defense. Um, now the Eye Defense, I'm kind of liking because color me intrigued. This thing holds a tablet, so if it's 
purpose designed around holding a tablet or even a laptop. That's pretty slick. And if you can carry a gun where your tablet is, uh, that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, you know, you'd expect this type of wizardry from Galco, <laughs> even though they're pricey again. Uh, you know, the only thing that worries me about these type of carry options at the, is that they are off body. And what I mean by off body is, you know, I carry my gun inside my waistline on my belt and it stays there. Right. I, I don't I don't take it off unless I'm, you know, going to the bathroom or I'm home for the night in a day planner. When I used to carry a day planner, let me tell you, I left that thing everywhere. And everyone would be like, John, you've got a gun in there now. I'm sure you would think through that. Nope, I certainly would not. Um, I guarantee you, because I'm pretty sure I'm ADD, that thing is getting left somewhere. I just know how I am. Um, Ladies, I'm guaranteeing you some of you have left your purses behind. Um, You know, I've almost left my gun on the toilet paper dispenser. You know, it's one of those moments where you you stick it up on top because that's really the only safe place to put it or you're dropping in your pants. Um, you know, I've been known to pull my pants up after dropping it down in between my legs and going, what the heck is that? Oh, that's right. That's my gun. Or look at the toilet paper roll holder and go, oh, that is a gun there sitting. That is your gun. You need to take that with you. So that's how bright I am. And that's why these things (laughs) would scare me a little bit. Um, so yeah, take a look at those. If you like the, you know, carrying and open, those are good options, but really think through the, uh, would I leave it somewhere type situation if it's off body? And here's the other thing. If you got a day planner and say you just throw it on your seat, uh, what's that going to mean? You're going to just leave it in your car in the day planner sometimes. You're going to forget your day planner again in the car. Um, so just think through some some things to consider if you're going to carry it that way. All right. So <laughs> on the self-defense side more so of actually interacting with a bad guy and, and what you can and can't do. So, this article, I'll call it, when do you have to stop beating an intruder? <laughs> now, me personally, under this situation, I don't know that I would have stopped beating this guy until um, he got all the way back to his house. I would probably follow him all the way home and continue to beat him. Uh, so what would you do if you discovered a man in your teenage daughter's bedroom in the middle of the night? Most people would do anything and everything they could to protect your the daughter and the rest of the family from an intruder. So that's exactly what um, a Coweta County, Georgia man did when he came upon a 20-year-old Kewantrez Humphreys in his 14-year-old daughter's room earlier this month. <laughs> now, the daughter did have a relationship with this guy and know him. Know, and know him. Um, not, I don't think that they've worked out what that relationship was or they were just friends or what it was. But, you know, again, you walk into your 14-year-old's bedroom in the middle of the night and there's a 20-year-old man. Uh, an ass whooping is about to come. <laughs> so according to Fox Atlanta, uh, Fox 5 Atlanta, Ismail Casillas, the girl's father, proceeded to pound Humphreys to a pulp. No, that is not my interpretation. That is literally <laughs> how the article is written. I do love the term of pounding somebody to a pulp. That is beautiful. So then as Casillas, who was the father, went to retrieve, retrieve a gun, Humphreys jumped out of the bedroom window, and that's where Casillas took a wrong turn. So guys, there is in Ohio... And of course, wherever this was in Atlanta, if the person is no longer a threat, you can no longer continue to beat them to a pulp. (laughs) You cannot chase them down the street with your gun. Um, Once the father got the gun, he reportedly pursued Humphreys outside, beat him some more, and then fired a number of shots at him as he ran away. Now, mind you, I would be of the mindset and probably enraged that I would continue the pulp beating (laughs) once we got outside too. The gun thing, I... I, you know, who knows? I'm a nut. And in that situation, if I lost my mind, I might have fired a shot at him. But legally, I'm not an attorney, but you should not be shooting at people who are fleeing, right? Uh, but I am guessing <laughs> there's probably not a jury in this country, uh, with it being moms and dads, hopefully, on your jury, that would probably convict this guy. Now, I shouldn't say that because things are crazy now and. People would look at that as this poor, misunderstood youth that was just trying to have some interpersonal relationship with a young lady, and they were talking through the current issues of the day. (laughs) Anyways, uh, who knows how that would end up in court. So be careful, you guys. If somebody's no longer a threat, um, it becomes an issue. Let them go on their way. If they choose to flee, you cannot pursue them. You're not going to continue to shoot at them. So investigators say uh, that's where Casillas crossed the line because Humphrey was no longer a threat to him. Uh, investigators say they understand Casillas' rage, but Georgia law draws a line in continuing actions against an intruder once they are no longer a threat, in this case, fleeing down the road. So that's funny. Even the investigators are like, yeah, 
we agree or we understand, but we can't agree due to what um, what the uh, state law says. And again, every law, every state's a little bit different. Uh, just again, like I said, in Ohio, you have to be real careful. Um, once he's no longer a threat and is out, like the article goes on to say, you know, yeah. So let them go. If they choose to the fight, then you can take the fight to them and, and see what happens. Well, guys, I think that's about all we get for this week. We are pretty close to out of time. Um, again, you can catch the podcast at ohioppt.com, or you can catch it on the uh, Podbean website and Spotify and on Apple. It's out there, so you can catch it. Hopefully, my sidekicks will be back with me next week. Uh, we've had some issues getting everyone's schedules together, and so you got stuck for me for this week and got me babbling on the mic for close to an hour. So, But thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, we'll catch up to you guys next week. And again, check out all the shows every Monday night here on Self-Defense Radio on Karma Radio. Uh, every Monday from 4 to 6, you get Eye on the Target Radio with Rob and Amanda. 6 to 8, you got Mike on the mic and his close quarters combat and talk about some really interesting stuff. Mike's been around a long time as an instructor and is tied into some pretty Im- impressive people. So uh, pretty neat. So tune in, and then you've got me from 8 to 9 every week. And uh, hopefully we'll catch up to you next week. God bless, and have a great week. <laughs>